Hey, hey, welcome to Page Break. I'm your host, Brian McClellan. I'm to you during the freakish hail and lightning storms hitting the mountains of Utah. Before we begin, this is my first episode with a content warning. There is some swearing in this episode, so if you happen to be my mother or listen with little kids around, maybe come back to this one. If you don't mind, then forge ahead. Today's guest is best-selling novelist and screenwriter Pierce Brown. Pierce is known for the excellent Red Rising Space Opera. During our chat, Pierce dissects my childhood, and we philosophize about the headspace of writing, as well as our mutual love of video games. We talk about screenwriting, and Pierce even gives a bit of an update on the much-anticipated book six of the Red Rising series, and his thoughts on the TV show. Enjoy my conversation with Pierce Brown. I guess, you know, my entire life I've, you know, felt pretty strongly that I'm an introvert. Yeah. And then I suppose I've found how much I rely on energy from other people. Yeah. You know, to take me out of my own head. And I think with the, the same task throughout all of COVID, which is, you know, writing a book or focusing on, you know, uh, a labor, that becomes your life. And that's not fun. It's not why I'm alive. I'm alive for people, you know, right. in many ways. And so it, it kind of, I, I, I'm surprised how much it sapped my energy surprised yeah. how it was impossible to wake up with the tabula rasa you know what i mean yeah it's impo- you just carried over the anxiety or whatever it was that you went to bed with day in and just, day out right every single day you're like oh you look around and you're like oh it's new day same shit yeah and soon the metric became not so much progress which it was at first but then the lack of progress of where i thought i should be at the time yeah you know yeah and uh not very conducive to evolving a story i guess Right. Does that make sense? Right. It, it just felt like kind of the same note the entire time. And I'm just kind of hammering it on. You know, I, I was surprised by that. I, I saw that you had mentioned back in April that you, you just tossed a huge chunk of writing. Yeah, hundreds of pages. I don't know. It was like more than half a book. Yeah. Yeah. It just didn't feel I, right. I, I did the same thing uh, twice with the, the current book that, that's finally done. And like, oh, good for in. you, man. You finished it up. Yeah, it's finally done and I'm happy with it. But but I did it twice where I just, I threw out, uh, I must have thrown out a few hundred thousand words. Yep. And I just. Sounds about right. It, it feels terrible when you do it. But also there's like a, I don't know, there's also a sense to me at least, there's a sense of um of like freedom of, of throwing something out and saying, you know what, I can do better. And then starting again and plowing through. Yeah, it definitely does rejuvenate you, I guess. Um, part of the problem is when you start feeling insecure about that 100,000 words or whatever yeah. it is, and you're trying to build off of that, particularly yeah. if it's the beginning of your story, and you're just building on a cancerous branch, you know, and you know it's just going to fall, and you're like, I don't even know where my characters are because I don't believe the stuff that happened before. Yeah. That's how it feels to me. So it's like the anxiety of knowing the work I'm putting in on the day and the, the life I'm sacrificing, you know, spending, because this is what we're doing, right? You, you spend time right. on a project with the uh, the hope that you're relating a story that means more than the sum of time you put into it. Yeah. But, when you, but when you're just building on something that you inherently are insecure about or don't like, gosh, it feels like a waste of time. And uh, since those are the days, those are the weeks where you're just like, then you have to hack the branch off. And that, it's hard. Yeah. Um, especially when, no, totally yeah, especially when you start uh, writing again and you're like, Oh, this isn't it either. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's so true. Like, man, what you said though, about building on something that you're already insecure about, God, that is, that is tough. Like, like I'll, I'll do that and I'll, I'll even know that I'm going to have to rewrite it all. And I'm like, but I have to hit a deadline. I have to be able to tell my editor that that I have something for her. Sure, sure. You don't want to be ashamed of your of yourself for being unproductive. Right. You know, you want to be responsible. You want to, um, you like, if you probably have the relationship or respect with your editor like I do, and I, I want them to respect me and to be the person yeah. that turns in the work that they expect from me on the in the time that they expect it. And so when you don't hit that, then you're like, that's another thing pressing down on you. <laughs> but I'm right. so past my deadline in this last this one that I'm almost like water seeking a, the shape of a vase. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I just need, you know, you almost need that structure, that pressure of the deadline to make you just realize it can't be perfect. 
Yeah. Um, and and you don't want to be that writer that, no. you know, everybody's that everybody definitely talks about, even though we say that we don't talk about them, you know, like the writer who's always, Oh, you know, no, I'll get it in. You know, I'll get it in a couple months. See, it'll be fine. I've, I've, I've got it. It's kind of coming. It's coming. Two years later, they come out with like, you know, gray whiskers, and <laughs> yeah. three, three new neuroses. And you're like, here it is. I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. It's, um, it's tricky because you do long series like I do and you do thick mm-hmm. books like I do. Um, and sometimes the, se- the books just get thicker in the telling of the story because you almost have to feel like those big moments that you did early on in the story. You yeah. can't, you have to earn them more because you've already done big moments, you know, without much forewarning or without much buildup. And right. so then I, I find myself trying to overwrite and earn moments more. And so I'll write, 20 pages of unfun stuff to get to five pages of fun stuff. And then I look back and I'm like, oh, I just need like two pages of the unfun stuff to get to the fun stuff. Cause that's how I like writing. But in these long books, you start tricking yourself and with more time, like in COVID, oof, it gets a little thorny. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, uh, that overwriting, uh, like, like this book that I finally got finished, uh, that, that was the problem. I kept overwriting constantly. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so you'd yeah, like you said, like, It'd be like, you know, 40,000 words. And I'd be like, man, I, I, I feel like I said nothing in 40,000 mm-hmm. words, but I finally got to the scene. But now it doesn't even feel like a payoff because I, I was so boring beforehand. Totally, totally. And the funny thing is that most of our favorite series, I mean, most of your favorite series, you can probably point to the ones that get long in the tooth. Yeah. Um, and it happens, I think, with it's very hard for to have a long series past three books and not have that happen, I find. Yeah. Um, even even my favorite series, the things I worship at the altar of, like Dune, you know, they <laughs> turns a bit. Uh, uh, it's it's a different it's a different vibe at the end because the authors somehow seem to do that, and you know, right. you don't want to be that guy, but then you still are that guy, oh, and yeah. so it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like trying to. It's like you're you know. It's kind of like a, a soothsayer has told us our fate, and you, <laughs> and you're trying to run the different direction, but you just keep being steered back towards that inexorable fate yeah, of overwriting. Yeah. You know, it's it, it, my editors uh, and friends just tell me to you know finish the first draft because first drafts are where I, I struggle. I love mm-hmm. second drafts. My favorite's a third draft. You yeah. know, because that's when it gets spicy. It's when I actually convince myself I'm somewhat intelligent. <laughs> because I start like you know looping the story arcs together, and the secondary and tertiary characters actually have arcs. Yeah. Um, but that first draft, man, sometimes it just all feels so thin and bullshit that mm-hmm. I'm just that I just will constantly rewrite the first draft for months and months and months when you can't even shape it because you don't know the full picture yet. Right, right. It's like, um, man, but that moment though, that moment that when you're working through the edits. And you start going, mm. oh, you know what? I think I'm actually really quite good at my job. Mm-hmm. Like that moment is like crack. It's that moment so is. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I strive to feel that moment again, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the, I'm fighting through the, the last weeds of a first draft, you know, yeah. it's just, it's all on faith almost because I feel them with more time to look at the stuff you've written. Yeah. The, the more you see how it doesn't necessarily work, but you know, when, when you find yourself rereading in the morning before you're writing, yeah. inevitably that's going to be a shit day of writing, isn't it? Right. Because if you're rereading, it means you probably don't have a ton of confidence in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes, sometimes you'll do like a light reread of, oh, I just need to remember the details. But if you're like sitting there combing through it, then it, you're probably, that probably just means you didn't have any faith in what you wrote yesterday. Oh, uh, yeah. Especially, um, especially poisonous if you use that initial caffeine burst for a fifty-minute dive into what you've already written, doing editing, and then you realize, what the hell am I doing? Right. And then you go get another coffee and you sit down. And you're like, oh, I have no energy. Fuck. Right. Right. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I should just play some video games and get stoned, and then I'll deal with it tomorrow. And then well, you yeah. do that for, you know, like six months. <laughs> oh yeah, under the mantra of I should be kind to myself. Right. Exactly. <laughs> And the funny thing is, is that we all do it. You know, some people are better about it, but, uh, but I, I gotta imagine even like Brandon Sanderson even has those moments where nah, he's, he's like, immune. He's immune somehow. He's just, he's, <laughs> he's just there. There's like 13 of them. He's somehow cloned, you know, he's like a South Park episode. He's cloned himself and there's like, or there's like seals, like, what is it? Seals in South Park that organize the balls or is it? Man, I don't remember. 
I mean, I think there was an episode where seals were constructing stories with balls, something. Um, <laughs> that's why I feel like he's happening in Brandon's basement. Out in, yeah. yeah. He just says he has something, <laughs> he has something help working while he's typing. You know what I mean? I think, I think Brandon got that, like, he got that weird gene that I'm actually super jealous of in that writing is both his job, his passion and his hobby. Yeah. Um, Cause for me, writing's my job and I definitely have passion about it. But it's not my hobby at all. No, my my passion is writing. My job is writing. My hobbies are very different. Yeah. Actually, no, my passion may not be writing. My passion is reading, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, man, like, you know, that's where I that's where I get jolly or maybe on the third draft. My passion is writing third drafts, mm-hmm. you, you know, because it's easy to be confident when you see all the epiphanies happen, you know, yeah. all the convenient loose threads you find, like tying themselves together and all of a sudden it's a tapestry instead of a confusion of color and ridiculous sound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what video games have you been playing? Oh man. I mean, I jump around quite a lot. Like I'm, I'm very much like a, um, I don't really do like many first person shooters. I'm like, I like doing, uh, I like doing city builders and like, like four X games, like civilization, oh, you know, cool, things, things that I can like kind of sit down alone and like put an audiobook on or something. And then just, just play mindlessly for hours. Do you play uh, Stellaris? I have. I haven't for probably eight or nine months, but it's really good. Yeah, I just based an empire off of my dog because I found an animation that looked just like her. Uh, kind of a <laughs> fox. So they're the Eonians. And uh, they were a tech, you know, tech uh, research-based civilization because they usually go warfare. And I was like, nah, it's not that. It's not what yeah. Stellaris is built for, right? So I just did tech, but then I, I advanced my tech so much that I was like, you know, basically a millennium ahead of everyone and so i was just going around <laughs> fighting all the old civilizations because they were the only ones that could do anything and you can only expand your empire so much right so i vas- i vassalized everyone yeah. and then after a 17 hour binge of that i you know you know how the games all kind of get repetitive the 4x games sometimes yeah um because it, it just becomes a you just become a factory right? and it's this inexorable push of your civilization outward and you're gonna win it's just the hassle of winning yeah yeah, yeah I, I, I struggle with that with Civ and mm-hmm. uh, and Stellaris. I definitely ran, ran into that um, where like you reach a point where you're like, this game is really fun, but now I'm just like doing administration. Yeah, and and I I don't know. I, I assume that for game developers, for the, especially that genre, that's like how do you break up that end game grind? It's difficult. I find to even get to an end game without being in a position to just demolish. I mean, I think in, you know, the very hard difficulties, it's, it's difficult to even get to an end game. Yeah. Right. Like, did you play total war at all? A bit. Yeah, I did. Um, I say a bit. Yeah. I've got several hundred hours in the series. So yeah, yeah okay, I definitely okay, have. Cool. cool. Well, all right. I've got several months in the series, not, <laughs> like, uh, like playable months. Cause yeah. I've been playing since I was 12. Shogun was the first, uh, first game I played, like, I guess after command and conquer. So kind of Ooh, the next, oh, next man, command and conquer. Did you, did you play, okay, I'm going to just keep going backwards. Did you ever play Dune 2? Yeah, brother. I played that. Oh, man, Westwood? Oh, man. Yeah, I think they like, used the same engine as Command & Conquer, didn't they? Yeah, that was yeah. right before Command & Conquer. It was amazing. Was so I love cool, that game. Man. I love that game so much. Yeah, I remember it because, uh, I mean, I got it uh, after it was reviewed in PC Gamer. Mm. You know, that, w- that was my smut magazine back in the day. You know, because <laughs> I wasn't allowed for years to play video games. My parents just... My dad didn't believe in it. Yeah. And he had a rule, standing rule in our house that uh, we had to play board games. But then my parents mm-hmm. got sick of playing board games with me because I wanted to play all the time. Because I was just like trying to play Risk all the time. And it, yeah. They, you know, they got me the the machine. And then, oh my God, fell into Dune 2, fell into War Warhammer. I'm sorry, Warhammer, Warcraft, but, uh, Red Alert, Command and Conquer, Tiberian uh, War, Wars. Warcraft works with humans. Oh, oh, humans all the time. I just, I, I loved that game so much. Yeah. Like yeah. I remember when, when Warcraft two came out, mm-hmm. like I, I just couldn't get enough of it. No, I, I played through the entire campaign multiple times. Yeah. My dad it, took away the computer. <laughs> I had to have like a log, like for the household computer, you know, like, <laughs> you know, how many hours? Cause I'd be like, you know, playing that. I think those are my great loves, those games. And then Baldur's Gate two, um, Baldur's Gate two was a game. Did you ever play that? You know what? I think I did, but I, I, um, I didn't really get into RPGs that much until later. Okay. Uh, but but yeah, like I had, I had friends that I know played through the Baldur's Gate stuff a lot. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but but I, I I know one of them. Like I have a very particular memory of like having like a really bad snowstorm uh, that canceled school for like a week and going to a friend's house and ordering pizza and playing through. Oh. I, I don't remember which Baldur's Gate it was. I do remember it was a Baldur's Gate, uh, but it had a co-op and I don't remember which one it was. I don't think, I'm not sure Baldur's Gate 1 had a co-op. I know Baldur's Gate 2 did um, because I would import uh, characters that had already beaten the game. My yeah. characters, uh, yeah. and so I'd have two of my own characters, and they'd just be double wielding katanas, like the uh, the blade you get from the Red Dragon, and like they'd be wearing the Red Dragon scale armor, and we just like it was a slaughterhouse. <laughs> oh man, man! But like, do you ever do you ever stop yourself when you're in one of those binges of like playing one of these games for forever? Do you ever mm-hmm. stop yourself and wish that you could take these amazing games with all the things that they have going on nowadays? and go back and show them to the enthusiasm and sense of wonder that you had when you were a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I find it very difficult to get into games now uh, yeah. to really fall into it with the same, um, I guess, blind ignorance, the feeling right. of bliss. Yeah. Right. That, that blind sort of, it was uh, for me. Yeah. I think it was sense of wonder. It was just like, Every single new game felt yeah. like an entire universe. I was dazzled. I'd play, I, you know, I'd play command and conquer for days. You know what I mean? Um, when yeah. I found Morrowind for the first time and it first came out on Xbox. Yeah. Morrowind took me away, man. The musical. Sc- did you play Morrowind? I didn't. I, oh, that was, that was one of those ones. A friend of mine did. And I spent hours at his house watching him play on the like only PC in the house. See, that's and, how I got, that's, I mean, that's a game you can watch someone play yeah. i mean that's actually how i found my best friend in high school he was actually an enemy at another high school and we were like you know angry at each other about a girl and we we're about to fight and stuff and then i well, i think we got drunk we were like 16 and didn't <laughs> fight and then somehow somehow like it let slip something let slip about morrowind i'm not sure which of us said something um but then i you know the other ones had just snapped around and the next morning i was at his house looking at like admiring his character yeah. and him showing me are the daedric armor well cool armor that you get in the game right and then we you know because sometimes i'd moved to schools a lot so i didn't necessarily advertise that i was playing morrowind all the time <laughs> <laughs> you know i would just moved to texas so i'm like maybe don't lead with that and right. uh, well i actually hadn't been out yet but um but uh, yeah i think those games were honestly the ones that kind of tapped me into uh, the nerd spirit inside me or at least made me feel more comfortable with it yeah um because you could just exist in those games with the massive world building and feel that bliss you know yeah and i don't have that anymore i think the last game i felt that for was bioshock oh bioshock yeah maybe man i i want to say that probably the last one i felt that for was I want to say maybe Skyrim. That makes sense. Because Skyrim was my real introduction. Like, I had seen and I knew friends that played Elder Scrolls games before, but Skyrim was the first time I sat down at my own PC and, like, played through. And sure. and I think that was, like, my first real good, like, I'm playing, like, a grown-up RPG online. And yeah. it uh, that that one definitely... I think that was probably my last real sense of wonder. Skyrim is a pretty wonderful one to cut your teeth on, you know, and unfortunately, I, I mean, I, did, I loved Skyrim, but yeah. at the same time, you know, the pretentious twat in me was like, it's not Morrowind, yeah. you know, because Morrowind, uh, you know, because I was always comparing it to that childish sense of wonder that I had when I was like 13 playing Morrowind, right. you know, and also I think that they did, they did the difficulty scaling differently. I know they did for Oblivion. I think they did for Skyrim too. So in Morrowind, there'd be places you could go that you would just die. But yeah. uh, like you go into a cave um, that's in a certain area and it's an insurmountable foe until you're about like, you know, 50 levels higher. Yeah. Um, and then in Oblivion, it would kind of, it would scale the difficulty. And so it would always kind of match what you are. So a cave that's right near the capital would initially have like rats to kill and, you know, bandits. And then yeah. you go back and it has like an arch, arch vampire king, you know, later on. I'm like, ah, well, that's not really a sense of wonder because I'm not exploring. It's just matching me wherever I go. Yeah. And I think Skyrim did that a little more, but Skyrim is still a tight ass game. It's is a good game. I really liked it. Have you ever played uh, it in VR? No. I've been toying with the idea of getting a VR set of some kind. Uh, I, you can borrow mine, man. Like you know, <laughs> you'll you'll use it nonstop for a little while and then you'll stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But with the uh, Skyrim VR on the, I have it on the PlayStation four. I think the last time I played was like two years ago. Yeah. It was pretty epic for a while because you have these two hand toggles that you hold uh-huh. and they vibrate to show tension. So when you have a bow and you hold out one hand 
and then you pull back, you feel tension from the vibration in the paddle. And so then you release and it honestly is a completely different experience than shooting with a bow, you know, with a controller or on your PC. There's a sort of like engagement of, I guess, the central nervous system. So when you kill someone, you're like, yeah, motherfucker, eat it. Because I don't talk shit, you know, in video games. And then all of a sudden I was like talking mad shit <laughs> to the yeah. uh, characters and that. But I played it for a bit on that uh, until I you know, started having dreams that my hands were the toggles. And I was having body disassociation things. So then I backed out. Oh, man. Video game dreams are that's when I know I need to back off. Like when I'm starting to if I'm even like because I'll get them even for like my stupid uh, survival city builder games like um like uh oxygen not included if i played that game too much like i'll just start seeing little guys moving around in my vision when i'm asleep totally i i I had this thing where sometimes i will import like the feeling of the task so for instance last night i was playing crusader kings just for an hour and a half for bedtime you you don't play crusader kings just for an hour and a half i know i know but it was my first time actually oh um, because i've been delaying it for a long time and, you know, I just, I conquered a couple kingdoms and then just got, you know, fisted uh, by, like, <laughs> by like roving armies that were like 15 times as strong as my guys. And I was like, how do, what? Because it's been yeah. before I understand even like the basic guy. I thought I was a tough, I was the tough local bully. And then I just got fisted. Right. But anyway, um, I had this dream that like I was mixing and sorting in my head. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you, you know how you're managing your empire? Yeah. That I almost had this dream that I, I had these dreams that I was managing, but it was just the task. It wasn't like I was in, it wasn't that I was like the, the, the archduke of whatever I was in the, in the game. I was just doing this. I think my brain was still firing the neurons that I was firing during the game. And right. it was so restless to sleep. Like, you know, woke up at three o'clock, ate a bunch of peanut butter and went back to bed and I was fine. But <laughs> yeah, man, that's man. how I, that's how I exercise my video game demons, peanut butter in the middle of the night. That's that, uh. I'm going to have to try that. That's that's a good one. Yeah, the next morning might be interesting, but I well, I'd eaten, <laughs> I'd eaten some uh Carolina Reaper salsa, so I was um I was already uh going to have an interesting morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Hey, so you um you mentioned moving around a bunch and I was actually I wanted to ask you a little bit about tell me a little bit about your mom cuz you actually come from a really interesting family and background and Kind of your childhood. I think. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, my mom and dad were both um, born in uh, Iowa to pretty big families. Um, my mom, 10, my dad, 5. And my mom, uh, you know, came, she lost her mom when she was 7. And she was, I think, realized that she had to work really hard to get out of her situation. So yeah. anyway, I uh, came from Iowa and then ended up running uh, television stations. So uh, she was one of the first female uh, general managers of TV stations, of high-spectrum broadcast stations. So she would yeah. run them for like NBC or CBS and we'd bounce around market to market. And it started off, you know, in smaller markets and then got to the bigger cities and stuff like that. So, you know, I was terrified of anchors when I was a kid because their teeth are too big. And they all have <laughs> these like permatans, you know, the anchors of the 90s. Because yeah. uh, the 90s was just the height of uh, local news. And yeah, we followed, uh, we followed uh, my mom around. And it was interesting because my dad, who's kind of, you know, this big, strong Iowa guy, was the one at home taking care of the kids. And so, you know, it's always... Uh, conversation he has or he used to have with uh when we moved to texas with all the dads are like so you know you your wife's the breadwinner and he's like yeah you know and was completely content and happy with it so my dad and mom are both this you know very interesting couple that they just have this concept about um the family unit being a team yeah and so uh, they call it team brown it's so cheesy but my dad is always like team brown you know and it it, it does it is pretty cute and it's consistent and so you know we traveled and we lived in about the seven or eight states yeah um so i was like probably 11 schools during that time. It wasn't that fun. But it's had a great family unit and great role models of both parents. Um, and they didn't necessarily understand the, uh, the, the nerd gene inside me or the, uh, the writing thing, but they definitely supported me the entire way. And just my, my parents had uh, uh, a rule, you know, that if I went into, when I was a little kid, if I could carry the books, like if I could carry the books, then they would buy the books. Yeah. Um, then I got bigger and could carry too many books. And they're like, all right, that stack of 20 Star Wars books has to go down to five. Because <laughs> I would just come out with, you know, um, basically 25 EU books just stacked end on end in like every arm. And I'm like, mom, I'm ready to go. And she's like, <laughs> you know, because back then when you're nine, money's not real. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we followed, followed them around a bunch and, uh, books really were my friends more so than, uh, 
actual people because people were like, uh, you know, I'd always have to say goodbye to them because it'd be three years at one school, two years at another school, one year at one school. Yeah. And so the the books and the the narratives, particularly the extended narratives like the, um, Star Wars books or uh, Lord of the Rings or Dune, um, were things I just took with me. And so I'd always find myself. Um, well, I'd always find them to be my companions more so. And you know, I'd be reading yeah. at the dinner reading at the dinner table, which my parents didn't allow because we always have family dinners. Uh, so I'd just be reading at the dinner table. And they really helped nurture that, you know, in me. So I'm pretty lucky in that regard. Do you think that uh do you think all that moving kind of do you think that it sent you inward, or do you think that it helped you kind of learn how to reinvent yourself over a couple of years or 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 do you think it was just a, a mix of good and bad influence mm, insightful question brian <laughs> definitely uh focus inward to a degree uh and it makes i think when you're younger it makes you a little bit perform- performative because the natural instinct is to become one with the tribe whatever the new tribe is yeah um so i definitely have like this individual streak i have this contrarian streak in me so i'll participate with the tribal dance or whatever is going on but yeah. uh you know i'm not really i'm not really a, a like a uber like i wouldn't ask for anyone's autograph like anyone in the world i wouldn't right. want, you know like i wouldn't uh stick my lighter up at a concert or my phone up you know what i mean yeah. so i just have this contrarian thing with whatever the herds do it i can't do it i physically can't even if it's the right thing so i'd be like you know in church and everyone would be singing the psalms and i'm just like no i'm gonna read revelations you know <laughs> <laughs> i did the exact same thing at church did you? Yeah, yeah, man. Go to the sci-fi I, parts. I I hated I hated singing, but man, you know, uh, Revelations and Song of Solomon. You know, sci-fi and porn. <laughs> Song of Solomon. I get it, man. My porn was of a different type. My my favorite stories are David collecting foreskins. Oh yeah. <laughs> I oh man. I watched like a like a like a one of those weird little cartoons about some biblical story uh-huh. when I was a kid. And I remember it was talking about that story. And I went to ask my dad what a foreskin was. And he just kind of face palmed. He's like, oh, man, we have to have this talk now. Dad, you told me to read the Bible. <laughs> right, exactly. It's very educational. <laughs> very educational. So, yeah, to kind of summarize an answer, I, I guess it's it, it, it uh, nurtured an individuality simply because the constant was me and my family and yeah. the things I was consuming and the things I was into. Um, but then it also gave me some skills and tools to use. Um, but as we were talking about earlier with COVID, you know, I'm surprised how extroverted I actually am. And I yeah. think it's because of that, cause I like constant change. So when things are stable too much and steady too much, I'm like, holy shit, you, it's been two years since I had a book out. And so that's the metric of time. Right. You know, ob- obligation is the metric of time more so than like living sometimes yeah no totally uh do you do you find it stressful when you've gone a long time without a book out oh sure man because i seek validation through professional success i'm, I'm glad i'm not the only one <laughs> <laughs> yeah man nah no nah, definitely um definitely because i think that being a writer is already so um it's easy to indict yourself it's easy to indict what you write is silly it's easy to think oh what did i do last year i punch in front of a computer and typed, yeah. you know, um, and that can really minimize your life experience. And so it's opportunity cost, yeah. you know, because a lot of people have jobs where they're engaging with people, musicians, for instance, artists, yes, and a lot of alone time, but also performing in front of people, um, you know, actors, you know, artists, of course, um, but also working with teams, you know, writing is a very solitary pursuit. So it requires a different mental discipline. And I find it difficult without uh, I, I find it difficult to maintain that mental discipline um, without proof of labor, you know? Yeah. Like, so if I don't have a book done, then where's the proof that this pays off? Right. You know? And so that can be sometimes very difficult. Yeah. Man, that's such a good way of phrasing that. Cause I, I, I think about that all the time. I, I follow a lot of like uh, British comedy is kind of one mm-hmm. of my little dumb things I love. And, and I'm always super jealous of these comedians who can like, part of their job is getting to work with their friends Mm -hmm. and, you know, create a new TV show or a new something, Mm -hmm. but like together. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, there's this two pronged thing is where like my ego is such that I do not think I could co-write a book. But on the other hand, holy crap, getting to actually do my job with other people. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Collaboration is fun because you spur each other onward. And often, you know, your small little insecurity can be overcome by your friend, like the person you're working with, your collaborator, just chuckling and just being like, why don't we do it this way? Why don't we skip that? 
Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally logical. Let's do that and not waste two months. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I find that I, I always play team sports, and that's one of the things I miss from my youth, I guess, the most, is collaboration and, su- yeah. and shared success. Individual success is fun, but it's unrewarding, really, in the long run. I find that team success is the only thing that actually makes me feel that warm, fuzzy feeling. I, I did that a few years ago with uh, board games, where I just stopped being interested in playing competitive board games, and I just switched over to co-op games. Like, they're just, to me, that kind of, you know, the, the winning at risk, it's really fun, you know, or, or whatever your strategy mm-hmm. game of choice is. It's, it is fun, but like, like, I've reached the age, I guess, maybe, where sitting down and solving like a problem with a small group of friends seems so much more fulfilling. Yeah. One of my favorite things as well is like when a friend says something when you're collaborating or working on a project together, um, when they have their moments of when they have their epiphanies and you recognize it and you've been, you know, you've been going back and forth trying to name something for about 30 minutes mm-hmm. and then you just both look down and write it down because you know that's the thing. Yeah. You know? um, I have that with Mike Braff, uh, my old editor. Uh, quite often we just have that brain synchronicity and you just start cackling together because you're convinced you're both geniuses you know <laughs> and by yourself then you would like reflect on it and be like mm, is that the perfect thing is that the th-? you know but I, I think those 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 shared epiphanies are some of the most fun moments in life yeah you know, almost about anything um it's like you know why getting a drink by drinking by yourself and having a drink with someone else is a completely different experience shared experiences are why we tribal mammals exist yeah. We've been convinced by Western culture that individual success is the paradigm that we should accept. Right, right. Now, you recently co-wrote a film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it's uh, so The Blazing World, right? The Blazing World, yeah. With my friend uh, Carlson, she had a story she wanted to tell, some demons she wanted to exercise. And yeah. so then we got together and uh, uh, had some fun over a couple sessions, then, ba- you know, power the script back and forth to each other. And then when it was in a place where, you know, it was, uh, we could get financing for it, she took it and run with it. And then um, it became her beast because she directed and starred in it. But that was a yeah. lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. And it was, it was fun because, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't my beast. It was hers. Yeah. It was fun to just put my two cents in and to have no responsibility. That was <laughs> awesome, man, you know? Because you can just throw it down on the page and like, if this works for you, cool. If not, you know, shape it to the way you want. Yeah. Uh, have you ever uh, worked on screenplays? I, you know what? I Weirdly, screenplays was one of my first loves as a teenager. Um, because my parents wouldn't let me watch rated R movies, but I could go online and find the script for them. Oh my God, you were way more advanced than me. <laughs> and and so I would. that's what I would do. Like I, I, I read several different iterations of the matrix screenplay before oh my god. i ever actually got to watch it um, oh my gosh how old were you when the matrix came out it was 1999 90, 99 so i would have been uh 13 13 yeah yeah I, yep, I was 11 and my dad that was the first r-rated movie my dad let me let me watch i'd seen yeah. i'd already seen crimson tide and a few other things by then because i have bad uncles uh, who fall asleep during the movies and just would abandon me to the hard R content. And my dad would walk in and be so displeased. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, uh, Matrix, my dad set me down. And this is when I you know, talk about parental influences. Um, my dad said, I, I, this is a rated R movie and it has bad language, but I think this will open your mind and that you yeah. particularly will love this. And still, one of my favorite movie watching experiences, he also took me to see Star Wars in film theaters when it re-released in 96. Yeah. So my dad and I always watch movies together. It's one of our things. And man, did that movie blow my mind because, but my dad was shepherding me there through the F words and stuff like that. Not that Matrix is so bad now. But, right. But uh, that, that must have been a great, did it? Did any of the scripts end differently than the Matrix did? Or what, what were, do you remember? I, I vaguely remember that like the early drafts, at least the ones I found online. And I assume that since they were, they were very coherent so i assume that those are real um unless they were something people wrote up but 
from what I remember, the early drafts were weird as shit. I believe it. Just like super sci-fi in terms of like the technology doesn't exist at that moment to create all the various like weird androids and stuff like that, that they wanted to put in it that subsequently ended up kind of in the second and third ones and ruined the second and third ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, well, but that's, yeah, that's interesting. And probably right because Will Smith, I've heard the old rumor that he didn't, he was offered Neo and turned it down because he didn't think that they'd be able to pull off the, uh, the script technologically. Yeah. Um, but when you rewatch that movie now, I mean, it probably was went through various iterations because the final, the final script and the final movie is so damn efficient. It's yeah. one of the most efficient, most structured, most archetypal movies ever. You know, it, it, there's not a lot, there's barely a line that doesn't somehow play into the story or character development or necessity or tension. Yeah. It's so well done. But, but it's also badass. Like, yeah. like it, it combines both really freaking cool action Mm -hmm. with a very tight story and that's something that you actually don't get very often with with neo cyberpunk meets rob zombie very cool vibe i mean you know i've only seen that kind of vibe one other time done really well and that was in blade 2 by guillermo del toro um he did a really cool kind of like uh, that that's the one with the the guys that like kind of their mouths open up right yeah yeah there's this kind of like neo-gothic vibe going on through the entire thing you know i'm a big fan of the black trench coat you know black leather trench coat right you know there's there's some other things that tried it but uh it's a hard vibe to pull off like i kind of i kind of miss that late 90s um that late 90s drowning pool flare yeah yeah that's good stuff man i yeah but like but like going back to screenplays i Mm. i don't know i it's one of those things that I always kind of think to myself, oh man, someday you should sit down and play around and, and actually like, cause I haven't read a script since I was probably 17. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I would, I would need to, to really dedicate myself to sitting down and reading through scripts and re- reminding myself how they're structured and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, someday I'd love to do that again. Yeah. But who knows? I mean, that's always the thing. You always push off the ambition because of the, uh, responsibilities you have right exactly i've got i've got a contract for three books and only one's done so i i better do that and then once i finish out that contract it's like well i should probably get under contract for another thing so that i don't have a big gap and all that stuff so it just keeps rolling have you ever tried about kind of like reframing it in your mind by thinking of like the screenplay stuff as play time you know i i don't i i I think that i I might be a little too obsessed with thinking about story as work. Like, cause it, it definitely bleeds into other parts of my life where I, like I have a hard time watching dramatic TV anymore. Um, or, or even reading books. Like I just, it all, it feels a bit like work. So if I'm, if I'm watching something nowadays, I, I generally want it to be like comedy or something that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, I miss it. I miss, I miss the, like the the voraciousness at which I read when I was sixteen, sure. um, and and I just don't have that anymore. Now, if it's if I've got my off time, it's like, well, I'll plop down and spend twelve hours playing the video game, and mm. I I don't know, I, I kind of regret that, and I wish I, I I hope that someday I'll be able to break out of it. Do you find yourself emotionally rewarded when you play video games, like during and afterwards? Mm, sometimes. Because I have two different modes when I play video games. Mm -hmm. One of those modes is I deserve a break. I'm sitting down. I'm enjoying this. And I love that. That's like like sitting down with a new game. The best feeling in the world. uh, when When I don't have anything else to do. But the other mode that I play video games is... I'm avoiding real life, mm. so I'm just gonna bury my head in a game, mm-hmm. and that's that's when my like love of gaming gets kind of bad for me, I guess. Mm-hmm. And which do you do more often? Ooh, probably the latter. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Just out of curiosity. Oh man, I honestly I think about this a lot, and it's it's uh, it's an avoidance technique, you know. Like when I when I was a kid, when uh my my dad was pretty obsessed with the uh with you know you do your chores and you do the things that need to be done first Mm -hmm. and i hated that i hated it with a passion because it would be like saturday and my friends would 
you know, have plans to get together whenever they rolled out of bed at 3 p.m. And my dad would be, you know, pounding on my door at eight saying, yeah, well, it's time to go mow the lawn. And it's like, man, I'm I'm 14. I want to I want to I want to just stay in bed until whenever and then get up and go hang out with my friends. I don't want to go work in the yard. Uh, and I so so that kind of that kind of like necessitated responsibility was something that I just, I ran away from at every opportunity. Like if my dad turned around, I was inside on my computer uh, playing a game. Like so, it, so when you do was, that avoidant technique now, do you feel the I, same sort of anxiety that you felt like when you were a kid? Yeah, I, th- I think that it just straight up comes from that. Interesting. Yeah, I, I have a similar feeling. Um, less with video games and more with uh, inefficient work. You know, work yeah. inefficiently just to mollify my, you know, the feeling of I should be working. Um, yeah. But uh, what I've really tried to do now, because I found the same uh, lag, I, not lag, uh, difficulty, I suppose, in finding new stories and even reading and uh, watching TV and stuff like that. And I'd find myself sedating myself instead of actually being, uh, in, you know, actually enjoying it in the yeah. way that I want to, instead of going in with, with my responsibilities done, blah, blah, blah. And so I've really kind of pivoted to audiobooks um, mm. now. So the intervening time, you know, I, I can spend. Uh, so I'm not like spending time sitting down to read uh, as much. I still try to do it, you know, several times a week, and I, I still plow in. But I found uh, this. I've refound se- not series that I've refound the type of books that I like, and yeah. I think it's really hard. Sometimes you just think that you've read all the series out there that you want to. Or you've read all your kind of things that will do the deep dive. You'll never find another Lord of the Rings, and maybe you won't. But, uh, you know, I've recently found this. I, I really enjoy the, uh, the Greco-Roman period, um, mm-hmm. a big Hellenist. Um, and there's this, you know, series written by Christian Cameron, who's a military fiction writer. And he writes about uh, spearmen from Plataea during the Persian Greco Wars. And it's a seven, eight, six or seven book series. And, you know, each book's like 18 hours recording. And I mowed through them in a month. You know, yeah. I find myself like going on hikes or driving further than I needed to just to listen to them, you know. Yeah. And so the only other series I've really done that with was all the Richard Sharp books because I did that with Ooh. all like 22 or 24 of them or something, you yeah. know, and uh, it really does create that when you don't have guilt attached to it, it really does create that zone again in your head that you allow yourself to dig into the story. Cause you know, I'd be listening and do it like three in the till three in the morning till I just faded out to sleep um, and stuff. So maybe, maybe switching up the, uh, maybe switching up the way you consume it might help. Yeah. Um, at least that's what I've tried to do because I've backed off of dramatic TV too. There's not a show I'm watching right now, yeah. um, except for Rick and Morty. You know, <laughs> you're but like that's like that's comedy though. Like yeah. Yeah. In, in my head, that's that is around the corner from what I do, and so totally. it's still fun. Yeah, and I'll find myself like you know eating lunch and watching a stand-up comic for twenty yeah. minutes. You know, instead of doing anything else. You know, I almost like avoid you know mo- shows I want to watch or movies I want to watch because I'm just like ah. Eh not the right space for it right right yeah it is funny trying to find that magic again when it becomes your job you know in for for screenwriting maybe you know do you write on your computer yeah so maybe you write this some just on hand and don't worry about doing the screenplay things but just tell a story like you used to you remember you used to tell stories you you know man uh study hall in high school uh study hall was sit down and write stuff um and uh oh man you, you saying that brought like a really sharp memory of of playing around with this dumb script that my friends and I were ostensibly writing and by ostensibly I mean they were pitching in ideas and I was I think doing most of the actual writing um about like it was some ridiculous gangster trope filled thing where we where we were each various characters in the in the script mm-hmm. and uh I don't even remember how much I had written on it, but, but man, yeah, that, that kind of feeling of, of just dicking around with, without having all the knowledge of like an adult storyteller who has been doing this for years. Like, Do you that was, your, that was did, did you notice your voice change the entire vocal pitch? <laughs> did it? Yeah, man. It's an entirely, di- cause it's an entirely different part of your brain. Yeah. You know, there's joy in there. Man, there is there's genuine joy there, and so when, I, and I think that's the stripping away of the professionalism, the stripping away of the anxiety of someone's going to read this. 
And yeah. when you're writing chicken scratch on a page, you know no one's going to read that because that has to be the first draft because you've got to transpose it anyway. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I find that when I have difficulty writing, um, going back to longhand can really help jog it up. Um, and sometimes I'll, like, I'll never write two projects at once on the computer. So my other pet projects, like screenplays and stuff like that, I explore first, uh, just type it, writing it down um, longhand. Man. And it's different. I, I, I like that. I, I think I, I'm going to try to take that advice. I, I like that a lot. Um, in fact, I even, when I, when I started doing notes for this podcast, because uh, I like to just take you know, a page worth of notes on each person I'm going to be talking to so I can remember things because I've got a terrible memory. Uh, and I realized quickly that typing it up kind of felt a little cold. And so I just started, grabbed a spiral notebook and just started, you know, jotting things down. And honestly, it makes me connect with what I want to talk about with the person way better. Right. I think there's something attached to, there's some sort of professionalism that's attached to putting in a word doc because yeah. you and I have thousands and thousands of hours of association of anxiety with word documents. Right. Uh, right. And formatting and all this stuff yeah. and writing, like I can't outline on a, on a computer. Like when I'm breaking a story, I outline pen and paper because I can't yeah. like, think I can't do like draw squiggly lines. I can't, you know, draw like a demon face next to a villain, you know, <laughs> it's like, all the, it's, it doesn't feel fun. It doesn't feel like, cause I started telling stories when I was like playing with my little toys when I was like seven you know, years old yeah. and, you know, dreaming up various narratives with my GI Joes versus my playmobiles, you know? Uh -huh. um, and that's because it was for me not to present to anyone. But yeah. word documents are to present to people, to be collated, to be organized, to be professional, you know? And that's not that's not what that's not what the joy is for you. That's the professional side. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe try it out. I will. I will. I like that. That's really cool. Also do it in a different place than you do your work. Do it at the kitchen table. Oh man, see that's I struggle with that. Cause like I actually have like a pretty big house. I should be able to move around and stuff, but like but if I'm gonna change, I wanna I want to go to Starbucks. I want to like get out, but like, you know, with COVID, I can't do that. But like, I, I don't know. Like, do you, do you game on the same computer that you write on? Um, I used to, and that created problems. I also, uh, but I found the biggest problem was when I was doing my administration stuff, my admin bullshit yeah. on my, on the same computer that I worked on. So now I yeah. have two separate rooms, um, because fortunately I've sold books. And I can afford two separate rooms for it. Right. So I have two offices. I have my writing office and then I have my kind of admin and video game office. Yeah. Oh, I should, I should do that. Cause man, it, I, I feel like having my game and my, my workspace be the same spot. Much less it's going to fuck up your back in a consistent way. At least you're fucking up your back in two different ways. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, uh, I should, I should definitely do that. That's, that's a lit. I, I like that a lot. I think I got that trick. It was James. I think it was James Cameron. He was writing uh, two scripts at once, and he he had two different desks in his house on two different levels uh, for each project. Um, yeah. And so he says he does that, or he said he did that. I, I don't remember when I, I don't remember what projects it was for. But uh, I read that like some eight years ago or something, and it really inspired me to do that. And I do find that it helps me to relax. It helps me to realize, like when I'm done with my work, with a, when I've got my word count, I close my office door. Uh, my writing office door and I have it's outside like a shed type thing and so I pad, yeah. I padlock it and I leave it you know and does it free me of anxiety if I haven't figured out uh, you know uh, if I'm insecure about a plot twist or if I'm like doing that old uh, which path in the woods do I take you know <laughs> you know if that doesn't go away but you know it does help 80% of the time of uh, shutting that off and then because I don't you know I don't live to write I live to live Right. But if that if you're in your writing room for most of the day, you're carrying with you the, that weight all the day or that association. And I don't like that. Yeah. When I go to write, yeah. I'm there to I'm there to work. Uh, no, that totally then, makes sense. Yeah. So but I find kitchen tables really nice for breaking ideas, you know, coffee or have a drink or something, or you know, it, you know, just have you try to keep your vices away from your writing, but you know, when you're doing your fun stuff, maybe have one of your vices. Yeah. It's a, a, little, a little bit more play. I, I read an interview with a, a British comic once uh, who talked about how he always was like three cups into a, a bottle of wine when he was writing. Sure. And I, I just don't, 
I, I've I've tried that and I just can't do it. Like I, my brain needs to be clear. Like I can't have music. I can't have other sound. I can't yeah. have anything really influencing what I'm doing. Uh, I I want to be able to focus. Sure, sure. I, you know, what have the other writers said that you've had on um, with regard to that? Um, you know, I don't think I don't think any of us have talked about it really. Oh, should we get into it? I I feel like that's a that's a good thing to to really like like the headspace that you write in. Yeah. Um, cause every single person's different. Everyone's different and everyone's neurotic about it. And yeah. I'd say half the, more than half the people are, are always trying to find out something better because what you're chasing is illusory, right? Uh, the white rabbit of creation or of, yeah. of epiphany. Um, and it's different for writers. I mean, I was listening to a Jeff Bezos interview and he says the job of an executive is, is to make decisions, right? But chief executives make decisions. And if he makes three good decisions in a day, he's done his job. Yeah. And as a writer, it's kind of the same thing. If you make three good decisions in your book, like three, like, oh, great moments. That's awesome. Doesn't often happen, right? Right. Um, and so you're always trying to make it happen, you know, by creating some new uh, cocktail. You're like an alchemist, just trying to mix things together until you can find the white rabbit again. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, I bought books, you know, saying the daily habits of, you know, past writers and terrible, terrible advice in there, you know, <laughs> implicit yeah. advice. I mean, they're not saying do this, but you know, it, it's, it's wild things. Like a lot of them, uh, especially writers in early 1900s loved methamphetamines. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. They loved, um, the, well, you know, you have the old Hemingway tales, but a lot of these people would only sleep two or three hours. And they'd be right. just kept alive, like uh, was it Balzac? <laughs> he was he did uh, I think it was forty thirty cups of coffee a day. Ooh, that yeah. that seems like that would kill you. Well, a lot of these people didn't really reach past sixty. Right. Well, and you a lot of those people from kind of some of those eras were like you know it was absinthe and an orgy was what made them have a really good reading or writing weekend. Sure. Like sure. yeah. And that, that kind of blows my mind. It makes me feel so square. Yeah. Yeah. You should incorporate more orgies into your life. <laughs> We've all been talking about it. Me and the, me and the guys and the gals. Yeah. We're just right, like, right. Ryan needs I'll, more I'll, orgies. What I'll square. check with Michelle and see how she feels about this. Cool. Cool. <laughs> it's for creative inspiration, honey. Babe, it's for the book. <laughs> right. Right. You want this to happen, right? Yeah. So I always find myself, you know, doing uh, various alchemy, trying to figure out what's right for me, whether it's, you know, meditation in the morning and journaling and then going straight to it, or if it's working out beforehand, or if it's powering five cups of coffee, um, or if it's, you know, drinking, which, you know, can, can sometimes jog things free, but then has uh, depreciating rewards. I forget what that's called. Uh, yeah, diminishing? Diminishing returns. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, but that has diminishing returns. And then, you know, God forbid you reread it the next morning. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, in the whole context, it might sound good. But uh, the funny thing is when I really catch the seam, so to speak, when it feels like scissors are just gliding on the paper, that's that's when I'm completely sober. There's no music. And yeah. I haven't even had coffee. And sometimes so sometimes I sit down before I do anything and I'll just glide and it's like 2,000 words. And I'm like, well, fuck. That felt like I was yeah. an Adderall. That felt like that felt like I was drunk. That felt like I was in the other headspace because we can all do it. It's just getting there. Yeah, and it's but it's such a good feeling when you when you realize that the passage of time had no meaning to you for like four hours. Yeah, and, and then yeah, totally. You just look up and you're like, I'm starving. Lunch was hours ago. Your what? body crackles. And you're just like, right. Yeah, and, but then you stand up and you feel empowered. Yeah, you feel good about yourself. Yeah, it's because you've cut the monkey off your back for a day. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got I got to spend more time figuring out how to cut that monkey off my back for the day. Yeah, man. I've I you know, I know it's uh trite to say, but I've been focusing like a little bit on meditation and uh journaling just one page beforehand um to try to kind of set my goals and to yeah. set my expectations of myself because there's you know, myriad vices that can lure you off during the day. Some of the vices even being administration or responsibility or doing the the laundry but right. you have that four hour chunk like you're a professional writer and you got there by being pretty savage with your concentration and time lots of 18 hour days you know just powering through weeks on end but then you lose that ability to do that once you have a little more comfort then once you have expectation then once you have less ignorance and when yeah. you have less ignorance you judge yourself all the time, right? Right. And so, you know, trying the, the meditation and the uh, the journaling is trying to let go of that to try to create that tabula rasa where you feel free again to do your thing for four hours, then move on. Yeah. 
but it's all a work in progress. Some days work, some days it doesn't. Yeah. I, I've had um, I've had more success with meditation than I had with journaling. Journaling, I find that I just end up bitching at myself for like, and, and it makes yeah. me more anxious. Sure. Um, but ever tried but meditation, uh, meditation does totally help. So one of my friends, well, I had a similar experience with the journaling. One of my friends, um, apropos nothing, was talking about how she has just a book, a journal where she, it's not a journal, she just writes down things that she loves. Not likes, yeah. loves. And so then I just started doing that. So I have yeah. like this long list of things I love. And it ranges from like the sound of rain on, uh, on a thin roof to the feeling you get when you get out of a pool and dry off in the sun to, you know, a smile on my, mom, uh, on my mom's face, you know, all those things or like to a moment in writing. And then it just makes me feel like thankful so much that yeah. the anxiety kind of sheds away. Because it, if you are positive, you know, it, it, think about it this way. If you go on Faces of Death and watch that for an hour, how are you going to feel? Mm-hmm. If you think about positive things that are your own, summon them and not a, not, you're not a passive participant. You're not watching something happy. You're not watching comedy. You're digging deep and like, what do I love? And then you discover all these things that you love that you really didn't even think about for so long or haven't experienced for a long time. And I think that that, you know, probably there's a very sophisticated uh, scientific explanation that Sam Harris could give us uh, yeah. about the neurons firing and being activated in certain parts of your brain. You're probably activating certain parts of your brain with like long term memories and things like that and the positive associations and dopamine release or whatever. But for me, it really just feels like a frequency or a vibration you're getting. And once, you know, you kind of hit that, it's shocking that you don't do it more often. At least yeah. that's what I've found. So I like that list, things I love. So sometimes I'll do that in the mornings. And I find that, that's to, be, good. I find that to be pretty helpful. It, it's interesting because I feel like we were probably both raised in kind of a time period where, where anyone older than us would look at that statement and say, oh, that's a, a bunch of hippy-dippy bullshit. You cheese ball. Be tough. Right. Fuck it up. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like... Like, is is that weird kind of growing into your own person and realizing, I don't know, like, and, and, and grappling with what, you know, maybe your parents or your older siblings or whoever told you, told you things were wrong or that they were dumb. Sure. But maybe they're, they were wrong. Maybe that didn't, they just didn't understand it. Maybe we're all just giant children with huge holes in our chests trying to fill them. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, that's what I think every you know older every, it's what everyone is, right? You know, we trauma. They, they you know they, the psychologists believe that tri- trauma is passed down, right? And traumas are like holes in us, right? Yeah. And so, yes, I was raised in that culture. I was you know raised in Texas and by Midwestern parents who were very tough and who were raised by very tough parents and who have a stoicism about them. And my dad would always ask, "Are you are you hurt or are you injured? If you're hurt, he doesn't give a damn. If he's injured, he'll take care of you." And he yeah. gives a damn a little bit, you know, and not to say that my dad isn't unloving. He's just tough, you know, right. and he's this really noble spirit. But at the same time, he would say that's kind of hippy dippy stuff. But what I found is that when I, and I would agree, and I would kind of mock my friends who did that. But what I found that I was doing is I was just protecting myself. I was projecting negativity towards the things without ever having an experience of it with myself and thinking them weak for needing it. Like, you know, I, for instance, would never see a therapist, you know, until this, until COVID. And then I'm like, all right, maybe it's time. Yeah. And I kind of looked down on that because I thought I could solve all my problems myself. And yeah, maybe I can. But what's the problem with, you'll experiment with everything else. Why not experiment with the hippy dippy stuff? And so then I found that actually it was the ultimate release because it doesn't fucking matter what my parents think about it. And I love them. But it doesn't matter what they think about it. And they, they actually love it now. They're, they're totally on board with me doing this stuff. But it doesn't yeah. matter what, you know, a Texas high school friends think. It doesn't matter what, you know, anyone thinks. It just matters about how I feel. And I know it makes me feel better. So then it was like a release. And it's like, I think it's one of those things is when you're growing up, you either choose to shed the fetters of childhood or you don't. Yeah. And a lot of us keep dragging the weight along with us. And you know, one by one, I'm trying to pick them all off. And that was a big one yeah. for me because I would just be an asshole to people who were like trying to help themselves. Mostly because, you know, I think people often become apostles of their thing, whatever their mm-hmm. thing is. And I just think that a replacement for the impulse of religion, you know, like, yeah. you know, people with uh, Teslas. Like, yeah, cool. Okay. But it's not a religion. Chill out. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> and people hating Tesla, you know, this, people hate Tesla and love Tesla to equal degrees on the spectrum. Right. And it's just yeah. like politics. It's a religion. People hate and hate on both sides. And it's something that uh, I found 
you know, that kind of knee jerk reaction of like having an opinion on something and hating something Mm -hmm. that kind of has dimmed quite a bit since I've started doing the uh, journaling and the meditation and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I don't have to shoot down someone else's joy. (laughs) I disagree. (laughs) Suffer. I, I always um like I, I think that most of my adult life I've I've been very much um of a mind of of that I that I don't have the energy to be really angry about things all the time. Uh and it's just it, it feels just like a waste. Uh it's screaming into the void. Why do I want to do that? Oh yeah. It'll certainly kill you faster. It wasn't until the last couple of years that like what you just said about why do I need to shoot down what other people like? Mm-hmm. You know, like that that's something that I, I kind of realize that I, you know, I, I totally do. And I think that, I think most people have that knee jerk. Oh, that thing you liked. I, it wasn't that good for this reason. Yeah. Um, and I, I realize that I do that just like everyone else. And, and it's, it, it, nobody likes it. Nobody ever enjoys receiving that. Cool. Thank you for your awesome critique. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I found it just to be a projection of my ego, Yeah. you know, and my ego isn't what I want to be. My ego is just my uh, defense mechanism, kind of, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, it's control mechanism being, you know, and it's also like your own insecurities when you're a writer. Like, who's who's bigger asshole about, like, story and like why that movie didn't work than a writer or a failed writer, you know? Yeah. Because um, a lot of people, I think, critique has turned into this form of self-projection, um, particularly with the internet. And you can avidly hate something, and part of your identity is then avidly hating that thing. <laughs> you know, I found yeah. myself found myself dating a girl and she likes uh, Maroon 5 and I, I just Adam Levine rubs me the wrong way so I just lit into Maroon 5 and afterwards I felt no better she felt no better and I felt like a little bit ashamed and I'm like and then a little, a little bit weak too because I was like why do I fucking care right and like yeah and I don't know why you know and it's probably just because Adam Levine was dating like a supermodel that I had a crush on or something you know what I mean and it yeah. just made me feel small. So then I'm like, I hate Adam Levine, but Maroon 5 is actually kind of cool. <laughs> so, you know, it's so funny. We just take these religious stances on things that don't really matter. Like Justin Bieber. How many yeah. people, tons of people loathe Bieber. Why do we fucking care? It's just Wh- not for why? us. Yeah. Yeah. Like One Direction. Yeah. I used to make fun of it to my little cousin. Well, One Direction music is meant for my little cousin. It's not meant for me. Just yeah. like my books are not meant for, you know, nine-year-old girls, <laughs> nine-year-old right. boys. You know, it's, it's, it's so funny, man. We just need to, we just need to have our opinions all the time because we're just so like, I identify with them, I guess. Yeah. I, I think there's something that we could probably dig into for quite a long time about, about developing characters based almost more about what, based on, on what they fear rather than what they love. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Because, because I, I feel like, especially, I don't know, like, not to not to get too like into it or anything but like especially like modern politics and stuff like that Mm. uh it's all based on fear rather than what you actually want to accomplish Mm -hmm. and it and it feels i don't know that it it makes me a little sick to my stomach sometimes because it's all it's all grounded and when you dig into why someone believes something that you disagree in with Mm -hmm. man you you can you can dig down and you you can find what it is they're afraid of so oh yeah look at the big biggest moving forces in culture forever uh religion you know yeah religion is uh a defense mechanism against death uh, yeah the unknown against not meaning anything um and that's the ultimate human fear right and yeah. what's been with us since the get-go religion you know whether whatever your creed is is true or not <laughs> right <laughs> if yours is what true the other it? ones if yours is true the other ones aren't but why do the other ones exist well the yeah. other fake ones if you believe others are fake um, yeah. must exist because of something in the human condition which is fear of lack of control fear of the unknown right yeah fear of death fear of fear of this being totally meaningless fear of inconsequence is a big thing man and that eats at me sometimes with writing because i'll be writing something and i'm like what does this mean like why does it yeah. matter i have one time on this rock why am i typing up a book that you know people might enjoy and everything and i do want to tell the story but maybe i should be in bermuda you know right skinny dipping with the the, the turtles i don't know Right, man. I I get that every every few months. I get that where I'll I, I'll just be staring at my computer, going, mm. "What am I doing? I've wasted my life. I've I'm not accomplishing anything, and I'm I've I've just I've not accomplished anything at all throughout my entire life." And then I'll have to stop and walk it back and give yeah. myself a pep talk. You're like, oh, you're a successful business owner sure. who's written a bunch of books. You have accomplished things. Who are you trying to accomplish it for? 
And but oh, gosh, and that's now that's a terrifying question right there. Right? Like, I just know if I get hit by a car, if I'm going down on a plane, I'm not thinking, fuck, I can't write my book. I can't finish yeah. it. Oh, no. The story won't yeah. be told. No, I'm thinking about the people I love. Yeah. Think about the experiences I won't get to have. Definitely. And I think most people will be the same, except for the pure artists out there. And God, <laughs> God, God bless them, but they're maniacs. Right. Exactly. And I oh, doubt man. many of them are happy. <laughs> Yeah, what, what sometimes I do think about that. Like the real artists, all are deeply unhappy people. <laughs> yeah, I almost feel like you have to you have to be out of control to be a real artist in in yeah. some way, right? You either have to be an, a tyrant um, or uh, depend like an alcoholic or whatever. Because I mean, not I'm not saying it's a rule. I'm you know I'm sure right. I'm sure that, you know you could poke holes in that theory all day long. But there has to be some disbalance where you believe with a religious conviction. Your art is more important than your time on this rock. Right. Than your bodily health or than, than supporting your family or, yeah. or whatever. And I fall into that. You know, I sometimes fall into that, that pit myself. But I think it's a culmination of a lot of things. I think it's a culmination of that question I asked you, uh, uh, who are you doing this for? You know? Yeah. You know, and it almost feels like there's a judge. You know, it almost, and is that something society put into us? Is that something I got because I was, you know, religious early on in my life? Right. Is that something of me wanting to please my parents, you know, because they wanted me to be a high achiever? You know, whatever it is that combines with the anxiety of trying to create self-worth and have something to show for all the time you've sacrificed. But that in and of itself, the time you've sacrificed is a hilarious, uh, what would I say? It's illogical because they have this term in uh, economics of sunk cost, right? Yeah. So just because you've sunk you know, five thousand dollars into a project and it's not going anywhere. That five thousand dollars shouldn't mean you should keep investing in that project. Right. It's right? a fallacy to think that so, that you have to throw, you know, good money after bad. And so then a lot, you know, a lot of times you'll have anxiety because I've already spent all this time on this thing. You have to finish this thing, right? But yeah. Maybe not, you know? That's not I will finish my series. So don't <laughs> Yeah, right. don't worry about that. But yeah, I just, you just you just had all of your readers listening to this all just went <gasps> at the same time. What does he mean? No, yeah, tr I'm trying to finish this fucker. It's just uh, I don't want it to don't want it to end end uh, bad. <laughs> I don't want it to right. suck. I don't want it to suck, man. Right. Um. I. Uh, I. Man. I've. I've been keeping you forever, so I'll try to. I'll try to keep a couple things short. But I wanted to ask you specifically for any of your fans listening. Uh, do you have? Uh, do you have anything that you want to report on either TV, film, or book six? Ah, uh, man, TV has been me walking and edging towards that uh, finish line. Man, uh, I honestly, I expected to spend most of this podcast talking about your experiences with that. I, I would, but I can't even like name my partners in it yet. Uh, right. But they're great partners, and they've got a great team, and we're just trying to eke it towards the finish line. Uh, toward a green light, you know, and uh, we've been holding back the news until the green light because, you know, options are a dime a dozen. And, right. you know, and I had an experience in 2014 with trying to do it with Universal and was very transparent about the process and stuff. Yeah. Um, but found that that was more for my ego because I wanted people to be excited that it was doing that. But, you know, I don't want to talk about something that's not going to happen. So yeah. crossing my fingers, I'm 90% sure we'll have a TV show uh, pretty soon. 90, 90, 95% 90, sure, but I'm not the money guy. You know, right. <laughs> Got to have someone sink 120 million into it. Yeah. And that's the thing that like people don't, a lot of people don't actually like get when you're talking about a, a writer trying to get something made is you're not the one that actually makes the decisions anymore. And I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm technically a co-creator on the show, Yeah, you know? And so it's not just uh, the exec producer credit. So I actually am in all the meetings and everything and my notes actually matter, I guess, instead of the exec producer thing. But in the end, your notes really don't matter because you don't have the money. So, you, right. you know what I mean? Um, yes. It's an interesting thing, man, because you're long for the ride at the same time, having this illusion of control, all at the same time, relying on people you've never met and don't even know exist saying yes. Yeah. Sure. I've talked to the executives, but the executives have bosses too, who have bosses, who have bosses. Right. And, you know, um, and I, that was the thing at Universal. Like we had uh, a lot of green lights from the lower echelon, and then it just hit a. It got to the boss, boss, and it hit a roadblock because she liked another property um, that was also named, uh, uh, what well, was Red Queen, which is <laughs> at Universal as well, which is a very, yeah. uh, um, in their minds, was very similar books. 
And so she decided to bank on that because Elizabeth Banks was directing it and she just made tons of money for them on Pitch Perfect 2. Now, of course, that didn't happen, but my option got cut because of that. And and so just because of her taste, you know, and and, and her banking on uh, someone who'd done a singing movie doing an epic fantasy. Yeah. And so that's how ludicrous it can get. And you're just like, well, shit, I didn't know it could go down like that. But so, yeah, no, no news to report, except hopefully I'll soon have news to report, which I've been saying for about four years. Right. But the thing we've been working on, um, the TV show I've been working on for two and a half years. um, So it's in a really good place and has a really good chance. So cross your fingers. Yeah. Fingers crossed, man. That's awesome. Oh, man, it'd be so fun. It'd be so fun because, yeah. you know, getting to see the visual mock-ups and stuff that, that, that we've done, it's pretty yeah. pretty special. I, I've only very barely started that process with this little production company that has Powder Mage. But, like, like having having the showrunner send me his pick pitch package that he's going to be sending out. I love like, pitch packages. Holy crap, it's so cool. Like, yeah. someone else gives a shit enough about what I do to make something out of it. How freaking cool is that? Especially if they catch the right tenor. Yeah. yeah I'd, love to, I'd love to see your books as a series because I don't think we have enough visuals of that era combined yeah. with magic because it makes total sense to me. You know, uh, like it's just such a fun, like, I mean, there's so much spectacle in that era of warfare. Um, so oh, much yeah. pageantry, um, so, so many codes of honor, but then also the kind of bureaucracy of the armies at the time. It's just very yeah. cool. It's like Jonathan Strange, I thought, did that fun too. They, they did a really good job. Well, it's the meeting of, um, it's the meeting of like, of the fact that you've got like, you've got the cannons and you've got the big poofs of smoke and you've got the two armies marching towards each other in lockstep. But then you can also have, you know, these duels, Mm -hmm. you know, you can also have people going out behind the shed to shoot each other. I love that. Yeah. And that like, so that you've got a little bit of both worlds. And it's fun because, you know, one of the difficulties I I encounter sometimes with futuristic warfare is the lack of, um, we have, you have a visual kind of in your mind uh, for armies marching at each other in rank, Definitely. you know, in yeah. echelon formation stuff. But sometimes for uh, far flung future stuff, if you're being realistic, it would be like Ian Banks and these ships would be passing at near light speed and the warfare would be in two seconds, right? And yeah. so, like, a lot of times my inner Reddit critic is like, oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, trying to, and, and also boiling it down to that dual conflict. Of like, how do you take a guy behind the shed and make it super intimate really quickly, and, uh, you know, one on one fight? Well, that's not it. Yeah. How do you take a guy behind a shed and make it super, super intimate? <laughs> I can <laughs> think of a few ways. I can think of a few ways. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's one of the fun things about that uh, that that uh, the Powder Mage era is uh, in Napoleonic warfare and uh, like 1600s, kind of through the early 1900s, is um, the resurrection of chivalry uh, yeah. r- running a butt uh, nation state. Right. Which is so cool. And the, and the gosh, the everything about it is interesting from the politics to the mm-hmm. kind of the way armies moved to, I just, I mean, there's just so much in there. And honestly, we've got a lot better records because it was so recent. Oh man. Those firsthand accounts are so fun. We know relatively so little about like, actual ancient warfare it's kind of when you like try to when you really dig into what we really know about ancient warfare there's so little that oh yeah that's it, present. historians are still at war with each other about what the spartan panoply looked like at thermopylae yeah what a what a cavalry charge actually looked like yeah uh you yeah. know st- things like that is it's kind of wild it is it is i mean and you know even when you have a first-hand account like caesar um caesar's uh gaelic campaign which is you know one of my favorite uh primary documents um it still leaves a lot up to the imagination leaves a lot up to interpretation particularly when you deal with numbers right was it what was it was it a million or was it a hundred thousand right because you know especially like the man the romans bullshitted so much on numbers well yeah because it was all propaganda yeah caesar sings total propaganda but at the same time he also has state-sponsored people with him who are also giving their reports so it's interesting because it's like you know it's also about building a myth sometimes you know herodotus for instance right you know um yeah some of those numbers but when you get to the napoleonic stuff i have these these landmark books they're pretty awesome they break down like the Napoleonic campaigns and the level of molecular scrutiny you can apply on some of these battles is pretty neat because you can yeah. like read the orders that they were given. You know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We got, uh, we got hijacked. What, what? No, <laughs> no, no, that's great. I, I love talking about this shit. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Same. Um, man. Okay. So I've kept you forever. Uh, but I always try to end this mm-hmm. with asking 
what the last meal is that blew your mind? Oh, that's a great question. The last beating meal that blew my mind. Ah, I finally made gochujang chicken the right way. Um, Korean chicken. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a, t- a you know day long marinade. Um, yeah, all from scratch because I love cooking. Uh-huh. And it was finally because I brined the chicken properly and I did everything. And I was finally like, ah, restaurant quality or better. Yeah, you know. And then I just I feasted on that for like three days. Um, oh, that was good. That was good, man. Um, That's great. Either that or um, a Bloody Mary and a pack of peanuts on a plane because it hit at the right time. <laughs> I love that. That's a good what was, your, what was yours? Oh man, for me, uh, geez, I don't know. I kind of, I, I got to the point where I, I, I decided I was going to start losing weight. And, uh, and so I decided I was going to start eating richer, but smaller. Sure. Um, and so I, I kind of have the bad habit of kind of eating whatever I want, as long as it's in like small calorie portions. Uh-huh. Um, so, so I, I had my, I had my nieces and nephews over six weeks ago and I, uh, I smoked a bunch of wings on my smoker, uh, and they they came out dynamite. Man. Just you know, smoke them for two hours, then toss them all on the grill for just five minutes. Nice. And, oh, oh man, so dang good. Wings are one of my favorite foods, but they're so seldom done right. I know, right? Like, because, because you can go to, like, BW3s, and BW3s, their wings are always overcooked, and they're really small, but they're not gristly which I really appreciate because I hate a gristly wing. I know. I know. It's a tragedy. And it's, oh man, I do. I absolutely adore. But it's so, you know, it's so hard when you're at restaurants because I always look the waiter in the eye and I'm like, are your wings good? Yeah. What do we think about them? And they always show up and they're always okay. Yeah. (laughs) They're always okay. Yeah. But every now and then, man, oh man, my favorite wings I've ever had was in this like, what is like Trinity bar or something like that in, in Dublin, Ireland. I had they had eight beers that they made there. So my friends and I resolved to have a pint of each. Yeah. And during that, I had like 36 wings. And I, I, I would hope to offset eight pints. I was 19. You know, I was, <laughs> I was still getting my wings under me. I still had, you know, I still had the uh, wake up with no hangover thing. Although that, yeah. day, that day I probably did. But uh, yeah, man, wings. Oh, you've inspired me. I might order some. Yeah, I've, I've, I've pretty much perfected them. Get you get, go to Costco and get organic their packet of organic wings mm-hmm. and they're they're not gristly, they're not too small, they're really good and then oh man, I like and if you if you've got the space like if you've got a patio or something, get yourself a smoker. I got a big green egg. So Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, yeah smoke some eggs, man. I've had that, I've had that baby for smoke some wings. 12 no, 14 years now, so we are intimate. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I'm I'm super intimidated by actually doing the work myself. So I just have a pellet smoker. I've never used a pellet smoker. And to be honest, the the, the using a big green egg is, is sometimes an endeavor. And right. honestly, that, that it creates a mode of entry. You know, I'm yeah. just like, ah, I don't know if I have an hour to set this up right. <laughs> no, a pellet smoker is like turn on and forget. So I, I use it once, twice a week sometimes. And probably a week from now, I'll tell you my pellet smoker's arrived. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> well, hey, man. <laughs> I got to do the ribs on it. Yeah. That's awesome. That was science fiction author Pierce Brown. Thanks again to Pierce for taking the time to chat with me. You can find links to Pierce's social media and to his books down in the show notes. You can find me, as always, at brianmcclellan.com. Special thanks to James Sutter for music and Tom Bishop for production. If you'd like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash pagebreak or buy my books in ebook, paperback, or audio. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 